Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Chris, and oh boy, it's been a while. 101 Towers has been on fire, and we've only just been able to put it out. Granted, my first solution was to make a second, larger fire in the hopes that the first fire would feel like it wasn't doing a good enough job and just give up. I didn't know it would just make things worse. Anyway, we've got a jam-packed video filled with facts for you today. Facts specifically about the fascinating world of paganism. But, what is the true meaning of the word pagan? How does Wicca come into paganism? And do you think if I use a fire extinguisher in the first place, I wouldn't have lost my anime love pillow? Two out of these three questions are going to be answered, so sit down, grab a stick, know a better stick, and have some mouthwash with 101 facts about paganism. Number one. Usually people tend to associate paganism with the Wiccan world, but are they really the same thing? Let's find out. Number two. Well, to keep it quite simple, Wicca itself is a pagan witchcraft tradition. You could say it's a branch of paganism, as intended for contemporary pagan witchcraft. Number three. Speaking of which, in a similar way, Wicca and witchcraft are not synonyms. I know, plot twist. In fact, though people often use them interchangeably, there are also pagan witchcraft traditions that are not Wiccan. And we'll get into them in a hot minute. Number four. But for now, let's just say that some groups take influences from all around the world. From Asian Scandinavian, Germanic and Anglo-Saxon belief systems to other traditions that are defined by elements of their practice. Number five. In this sense, there are different kinds of pagans. Paganism is not strictly dogmatic, so devout pursue their own vision of the divine as a direct and personal experience. Number six. Generally speaking though, you know, for the sake of this video, we can say that paganism emphasizes the importance of developing close links with nature. Number seven. And for those who actively practice the doctrine, they show their connection with nature through rites that frequently take place outdoors. Number eight. It also stresses the importance of guardianship of the earth and environmentalism, and the equality of the sexes is dominant. Although women play a significant role in ceremonies and goddesses are of great importance. Number nine. Festivals are a great way to connect and celebrate the natural world. According to the pagan seasonal cycle, often referred to as the wheel of the year, there are eight festivals to celebrate every year. Number 10. They are spaced every six or seven weeks throughout the year and divide the wheel into eight segments. You ever heard of the winter and summer solstice? Yeah, well, they're part of the wheel. Number 11. But to fully understand paganism, we must go back a little bit to its origins, when pre-Christian religions were still popular in Europe. The term itself comes from the Latin paganus and refers to those who lived in the country. Number 12! Specifically, when Christianity became popular in the Roman Empire, it did so primarily in the cities. The people who lived in the country and who continued to believe in the old ways, meaning not Christian, came to be known as pagans. Number 13. Still, those under the Jewish and Islam faith also use the term to refer to anyone outside their religion. To keep it simple, most people define paganism as being without religion. Number 14. But in the strictest sense, all pagans were those attached to authentic religions of ancient Greece and Rome and the surrounding areas, even earlier in other territories. Number 15. In Wiltshire, in West England for example, there's a unique collection of ceremonial monuments and burial mounds that span several periods of prehistory. The earliest of them tell us that kinship and the support of a clan's ancestors seems to have lain at the centre of the conception of spirituality in prehistoric Wessex. Number 16. If we consider Germanic groups with the last converted to Christianity, we could say that old paganism persisted throughout the 4th century, the 6th and 7th century, and up until the 10th century in smaller areas. And overall, the pagan religion held out longest in the most northerly lands, like Iceland, Norway and Sweden. Number 17. Still, as they say, history is circular, and in fact the doctrine made a comeback during the 1500s. Fair enough, after all. In the Renaissance period, people introduced ancient Greek philosophy, arts and concepts, which included paganism. So, pagan symbols and traditions entered European art, music literature and ethics once again. Number 18. In Renaissance paintings, pagan gods, statues, monuments and other references are very easy to spot. In The Adoration of the Magi, a painting painted using paint made around 1484, attributed to Domenico Morone, has the Holy Family standing under a stable fashioned from a derelict antique temple. Number 19. 
In the same picture on the upper left corner, there's also a statue of a pagan god surmounts a fractured cornice of the building. Number 20. In St. Apollonia destroys a pagan idol from 1442, by Venetian painter Giovanni di Alimagna, St. Apollonia is shown halfway up a ladder, wielding a hammer to destroy a statue of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine and orgiastic excess. Number 21. Oh, and the image of the ancient god is obviously naked. But these are just a few of the many artworks containing pagan symbols back then. Maybe we'll get into it later. I don't know about you, but... Uh... But the good times of the 16th century were soon over. The reformation of the 17th century put a temporary hold to pagan thinking, as Puritans and pluralism took over. Okay, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. I'm gonna do my 23, my 23, my 23. But Greek and Roman classics, with their focus on paganism, came back at the beginning of the following century, during the Enlightenment of the time. Since then, the pagan fever slowly grew up throughout the 1800s and reached its peak in the 1900s, when modern forms of Buddhism and Hinduism were growing in popularity. Number 24. And here we get to know modern neo-paganism that has its roots in 19th century romanticism and activities inspired by it, such as the British Order of Druids. Number 25. Yeah, and the popularity of the Druid revivals also led to many scholars in the early 20th century to explore the ancient spirituality of the British Isles and Europe. Number 26. Still times were tough, and between the 1930s and 1950s, there was a variety of neo-pagan groups associated with extreme nationalism, particularly in Europe before World War II. Number 27. The doctrine also flourished in the post-war decades, particularly in the United States and the United Kingdom and in Scandinavia. Major groups formed, like the Church of All Worlds, which centers on worship of the Earth Mother Goddess, and it's the largest of all the pagan movements. Number 28. Ferifaria also worshipped the goddess but was based on the ancient Greek religion, while the pagan way was a nature religion centered on goddess worship and the seasons. Number 29. But also the reformed Druids of North America, the Church of the Eternal Source, which revived ancient Egyptian religion, and the Viking Brotherhood, which celebrates Norse rites. Number 30. Contemporary neo-paganism of the 1960s and 70s went instead in the opposite direction, as it was embraced by ecological and feminist movements. Number 31. Now influenced by the works of psychiatrist Carl Jung and the writer Robert Graves, people are more interested in nature and archetypal psychology than in nationalism. Pagan philosophies appealed to many eco-activists who also saw nature as a sacred and recognized the great goddess as Mother Nature. Number 32. At the beginning of the late 1970s, some feminists also opened to feminine personifications of the deity and became interested in witchcraft and neo-paganism. Number 33. Today, paganism looks very different. It is a global movement that consists of many different perspectives. Most pagan religions have practices that blend different traditions such as Celtic, Greco-Roman, Native American, Ancient Egyptian, and Norse. Number 34. Now that we've covered the historic side of it, why do we get into the specificities of each pagan group? Starting with heathenry, originally from the pre-Christian North European people who lived in the North Sea, which included those from Anglo-Saxon England, Scandinavia, Germany, and Frisia, or Friesland. Number 35. Modern heathen groups are scattered all over the world under various names, like Asatru, the Northern Tradition, Odinism, Fawn Said, or Germanic Pagan Reconstructionism. Number 36. In Iceland, heathenry is even nationally recognized religion. Some believe the endurance of the doctrine can be linked to the late conversion of the country. In fact, Iceland did not confirm to Christianity until the 11th century. Number 37. Okay, but what are their beliefs? Well, like most pagan religions, heathenry is polytheistic. Therefore, it recognizes a large number of gods and other spiritual entities. We'll get there in a millisecond. Number 38. First, I have a fun fact for you. Now, heathen gods are from Norse mythology though they're often referred to with the anglicized versions of their Norse names. However, they were honored by many peoples outside of Scandinavia, too. Number 39. For example, the god known as Odin in Old Norse was also named Woden in Anglo-Saxon and Wudhanaz by early Germanic tribes, becoming Ruatan in Old High German. Number 40. Heathen's gods are divided into groups. The most important are known as the Major Gods, most of which made it somehow to our days. They've contributed to the English days of the week. Number 41. Tuesday comes after two, Tyr, Wednesday after Wooden, Odin, 
Thursday after Thunor, Thor, and Friday after the goddess Frigg, or Frigg. The meaning of life. In addition to these, there are several dozen local and tribal gods. Medieval literature, runic inscriptions, and votive stones are full of those. Still, most heathens choose to actively honour a subset of gods with whom they have developed a personal relationship with. No, number 43. It's number 43. Oh my goodness. Not that it makes much of a difference since offerings are usually made to all the gods and goddesses in general. Well, they do relate to their gods as complex personalities who each have many different attributes and talents. Number 44. Take, for example, Thor, who is popularly known as the mighty hammer-wielding god of thunder. In the heathen circles, he's so much more than that. He is the deep thinker, the man's well-wisher, and even the consecrated Thor, who reveals a gentler side to his nature. Number 45. So yeah, making specific offerings for each of those very complex gods might be complicated. Additionally, the religion also recognizes and relates to a wide variety of spiritual beings or whites. Number 46. Among them, the Norns, three female entities who weave the web of Weird and the Dithir. We'll get to that in a moment. Are female ancestral spirits attached to a tribe, family, or individual. But elves, brannies, dwarves, and ettins are also part of numerous hidden folklore spirits they intertwine with. Number 47. Now, we've just mentioned Weird as part of the Heather's mythology, but what exactly is it? And why is it such a central concept in the doctrine? Simply put, Weird is the force that connects everything in the universe throughout time and space. So yeah, it's quite important. Number 48. More specifically, heathens believe that all of their actions can have far-reaching consequences through the web of Weird. For the same reason, who they are, where they are, and what they're doing today are consequences of the actions they and others have taken in the past. Number 49. With an understanding of Weird comes great responsibility. Look like there's a Peter Parker hidden in every heathen. Seriously though, the strong implications that will arise from knowing that our actions will affect everyone's future will give us an ethical obligation to think carefully about the possible consequences of everything we do. Number 50. Or at least, it should. I wish there were more heathens in this world. As we can witness every day, people don't really care about others or the future of Earth. Nonetheless, one of the principal ethics of heathenry is that of taking responsibility for one's own actions. Number 51. No wonder another strong value is Frith, which is the maintenance of peace and friendship within a social group. Number 52. Hospitality is a great value too. So is giving gifts, plain speaking honesty and forthrightness. This means that any form of oath taking is taken extremely seriously. No heathen will sign their name to something unless they can assent to it in both letter and spirit. Number 53. Since the doctrine is focused on the right living in the present and does not focus on the afterlife as much as other religions do, it all adds up. Still, you may have heard of Valhalla, Odin's Hall, which is popularly perceived as the Norse equivalent of heaven. Number 54. However, that's not accurate. According to Norse mythology, as recorded in the Eddas, only warriors who die in battle have access to Valhalla. That isn't counting those who don't go to Freya's Hall. Y yeah, like Odin and Freya splits their losses. Number 55. Ooh. Then there are those who drowned at sea, who go to the goddess Ran's Hall, while people who died of natural causes go to the Hall of the Goddess Hell which is where most of today's heathens see as a neutral place where everyone will be reunited with their ancestors. Number 56. So you might have guessed at this point, there are no central authorities in heathenry and no single organization to which all heathens belong. There is no widely recognized priesthood, but sometimes individuals may be recognized as goddess or gaidas, priests and priestesses, with their own communities. Number 57. Yep, there are, in fact, national and international organizations created to facilitate networking between the adepts, who usually belong to small groups made up of friends and family members. Number 58. Those groups are sometimes called hearths or kindreds, and meet for religious rituals in members' homes or in outdoor spaces. The main rites are called bloat and sumble. Number 59. Heathens host feasts and celebrations based around them to celebrate important events, such as weddings or baby namings, seasonal holidays, and oath takings. Number 60. 
A bloat was originally the ritual sacrifice of an animal to one or more gods, elves, or ancestors, mostly to gain their favor for specific purposes such as peace, victory, or good sailing weather. Number 61. Sumbul is a ritual drinking ceremony in which one or more drinking horns or other vessels are filled with mead and used for toasting or boasting. Yeah, it's basically toasting, but not quite. Modern heathens pass the horns around in several rounds. Number 62. The first round of toast is to the gods, the second to the whites or ancestors, and the third round may be to whatever else the assembly wished to toast. Among other magical practices, heathens carve runes onto talismans and observe the chanting of charms called Galdor. Number 63. Some perform a ritual called Oracular Said, where a seer or seeress answers questions or gives advice to participants, and many modern adepts also practice runic divination. A Nintendo 64. The goddess movement part of the neo-pagan wave is rather new as it emerged predominantly in North America, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand in the 1970s. Number 65. The movement is made of various groups and it's constantly growing and changing, but primarily we could say that the common ground is a reaction to the predominant organized religion as male dominated. Number 66. In this sense, its participants make use of goddess worship and can include a focus on female people, or on one or more understandings of gender or femininity. Number 67! To do so, they invoke ancient religion and mythology, reinterpreting them figuratively and metaphorically as reflecting ancient understandings and worldviews. Number 68. In this sense, creation myths are not seen as conflicting with scientific understanding, but rather as poetic metaphoric statements that are compatible with modern theories, such as the theory of evolution, modern cosmology, and physics. Number 69. Moo Moo Macau. The particularity of the goddess movement that is that they believe ancient myths, that were created by ancient matriarchal societies, gave some key elements to Christianity. For example, the worship of Mary by Christians. Number 70. Consequently, the movement doesn't reject the devotion of female Christian figures. On the contrary, they embrace it as a continuation of ancient goddess worship. Speaking of which, most people in the movement regard the Earth as a living goddess, whether figuratively or literally. Number 71. For those who worship it literally, Gaia, another name for Earth, personifies the entire ecosystem and is the reason to achieve harmonic symbiosis and balance within the natural world and physical environment. Number 72. It's no coincidence that many of those in the goddess movement are also into ecofeminism, that's concerned with the environmental and ecological issues. They claim that the hierarchical scheme has given humans dominion over the earth, leading to environmental crises. I mean, they're not wrong. Number 73. The goddess movement puts humans and non-human beings on the same level, where humanity and divinity must not be distinguished from nature. The Earth is the body of the goddess and all beings are interconnected in the web of life. Number 74. Some participants honor the triple goddess of Maiden, Mother, and Crone. The Maiden part is the archetype of a young woman, representing independence and strength. Number 75. The Mother symbolizes a nurturing, mature woman, while the Crone represents an old woman with qualities such as wisdom, change, and transformation. It is believed to contain both positive and negative imagery. So, for example, the Hindu goddess Kali is often considered to be a crone. Number 76. The multifaceted goddess is easily reconciled with the monism of Hinduism, which claims to understand the fundamental unity of good and evil in an ego-knotted existence, which is basically the condition of human life. So, all sides must coexist. Number 77. Here we go. We couldn't leave the most popular group out, the Wiccan movement. Just like for other pagan traditions, origins of Wicca lie in pre-Christian religions, folklore, folk witchcraft, and ritual magic. Number 78. Still, most witches associate the birth of their religion with the Book of Shadows, a compendium of rituals and spells written by one of Wicca's major figures, Gerald Brousseau Gardner, during the late 1940s and early 1950s. Number 79. Wicca honors the divine in the forms of the triple goddess, made of the virgin, the mother, and the wise woman, in combination with the waxing, full, and waning phases of the moon and as the horned god. Number 80. The emphasis placed on goddess and god differs from group to group. Still, the majority of Wiccans believe that for the wholeness, the best image of the divine must contain both male and female. Number 81. 
There are no central authorities in Wicca, but most witches like to join covens, groups of like-minded people who meet together to worship the gods and to do magic. What kind of magic? Well, in their rituals, Wiccans aim to honor the deities by performing spells. <laughs> Number 82. Spells can have multiple functions, from healing to help with general life problems. The important thing to remember is that magic must be practiced according to an ethical code. So, for example, you can cast a spell only to help people and when it does not harm others. Number 83. I know it's very different, and maybe slightly disappointing, from the popular portrayal of witches. Hey, you're free to try out spells for personal gain, but at your own risk. According to witches, negative magic rebounds on the perpetrator, but magnified. This is also known as threefold law. Number 84. Covens are usually managed as the participants please. In some covens, it's common practice for more experienced people to act as teachers to newcomers and to guide them into initiatory traditions. Number 85. Other covens form when groups of friends who want to meet and learn together meet regularly. The classic number of people for a coven is 13, though many covens are smaller. Number 86. Oh, and Wiccans believe in reincarnation. According to their teachings, after death, the spirit is reborn and will meet again with those whom it had close personal ties to in previous lives. Number 87. Thanks to reincarnation, the soul gets the chance of experiencing life on Earth all over again, and then again, and again, until it absorbs everything that can be learnt. At that point, the soul goes into a blissful realm known as the Land of Youth, or the Summerland. Number 88. But one of the things that has made Wicca famous outside the pagan world is the celebration of Sabbats, Wiccan major festivals, which are held eight times throughout the year and mark changes in the seasons. Number 89. They are in order, Yule on December 20, 21st, the shortest day of the year, Midsummer on June the 21st, 22nd, the longest, and September 20th to the 21st, when the hours of darkness and light are equal, and then in bulk on February 1st or the 2nd, Beltane on April the 30th or May the 1st, Lunasad on August the 1st or the 2nd, and Samhain on October the 31st or November the 1st. Number 90. Sabbaths begin at sunset and end at sunset the next day. Most rituals take place at night, with nothing but the light of candles, if indoors, or the moon, bonfires, and lanterns, if outside, lit by the coven. Number 91. With indoor rituals, some witches have rooms set aside as temples in their houses. But since most people, especially these days, can't afford to have a spare room for Wiccan activities, others simply use their ordinary living space. Number 92. It is extremely important, though, that the place where the rituals take place is consecrated. They happen in the circle, which is always created anew for each rite. But what are the steps to create a consecrated circle? Number 93. First, the space needs to be swept with a broomstick to purify it, which also comes in handy if you're on house cleaning duty. Then you bless the space with the four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. Number 94. To create the circle, you draw its line in the air, around the chosen area, with a wooden wand or black-handled knife, the athame. At that point, you add and honor the four directions, east, south, west, and north. Number 95. Finally, when all the participants are in the sacred circle, the magic can start and the goddess and god can be invoked. Rituals usually end with the blessing of a chalice of wine and cakes that are shared among the participants. Number 96. Spring Equinox celebrates the renewed life of the earth that comes with the spring, duh. The festival has been celebrated throughout centuries by different cultures. Ancient Greeks, for example, paid homage to Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love. Number 97. In ancient Egypt, people celebrated Hathor, one of the most powerful and popular of the gods. Again, she embodied the essence of love, beauty, music, dancing, fertility, and pleasure. And even though she was the protector of women, she was also worshipped by men. Number 98. Scandinavians worshipped instead the ancient Germanic god Ostra, or Yostra, who, as the legend goes, transformed a bird into a hare. In turn, the hare responded by laying coloured eggs for her festival. Sounds like Easter? Yeah, you're right. According to German mythology, Ostara created the Easter Bunny. Number 99. Today, the traditional celebrations of the spring equinox continue. Pagans all over the world pay homage to their god and goddess that are portrayed as the Green Man and Mother Earth. Number 100. According to the myth, Mother Earth gives birth to the Green Man in the depths of winter. The man gets to live through the rest of the year until he dies at Samhain, the autumn equinox, to start over again the following winter. 
Everyone be quiet, it's number 101. There are several rituals that pagans carry out during the spring equinox. To mention a few, there are egg races, egg hunts, egg eating, and egg painting. Not too different from Easter traditions. So that was 101 facts about paganism. Did you enjoy the facts? Did you learn many things? Did you learn any things? Why don't you give us a little comment in the comment down below? Comments, plural. Also, while you're down there, why not like give us a, a handy little like and um, subscribe to 101 facts? Because, yeah, you know. Anyway, we're shout on the screen right now are two videos that you can look at. Look at them. Aren't they great? Okay, now go watch them. I'm gonna go, ta-ta!